Daily Detroit is brought to you by the community. Support our work at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. If you're a longtime listener to this show, you might have caught on by now that one of the reasons we're here is a love of places, specifically our places. The Detroit Tri-County area includes, well, three counties, made up of more than 130 cities, townships, and villages, and yes, even part of a ghost town. You could zoom in again and see countless neighborhoods and block clubs and associations, all the way down to the street that you see outside your window. In these places, there are stories wherever you look. You might find the next time that you go on a run or walk your dog or notice that one thing over your backyard fence, you know, to the left, over there. See, look left up. See, notice that? Well, maybe you never thought about it before. And when you travel, if you keep your eyes open, you'll see their stories too. It's pretty cool. Now, there's a field guide for these things to help you on your journey of discovery. It's called the 99% Invisible City, and it's by Roman Mars, who is my guest today. I'm Jer Stays. This is your Daily Detroit for Tuesday, October 20th, 2020. Roman Mars, welcome to Daily Detroit, sir. Oh, I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So one of the reasons why I wanted to talk with you is that I believe, this is just me personally, that design is one of the closest things the human race has to, like, actual magic. Buildings and, and, and cities and civic elements, they all make possible things that our ancestors a hundred or 200 years ago, they'd think it's like crazy sorcery, you know? <laughs> like a <laughs> cell agree. phone, like talking to your <laughs> aunt that's in another town. Yeah. That's something that would be like a multi-day horse journey, and we do it, you know, easily. But we do it through all of these, like, hidden things and... Little ways that are even just in our own environment that make it possible. Right. How did you first discover this hidden world? Well, I think I've always been someone who's been curious about the world in general. And a lot of that was centered on biology. Like I studied biology for a long time and I was really interested in the sort of intricacies of like, you know, how cells work and how cells divide and, and genes and all sorts of stuff like that. And then what really sort of cemented my interest in the built world was I was um, working in radio at WBEZ in Chicago. And there's something about that town in terms of its architecture and layout, which really calls attention to all the design that was really like centered on making a really regular and kind of, you know, as much as a perfect city as you can in a certain way, you know, like in terms of its layout and, and beautiful buildings. And I went on an architecture boat tour there. And the way that the docent talked about the buildings, I was struck by the idea that you really could do uh, audio show about architecture if you did the stories right. And that's really where I got that type of bug, for sure. Mm. You know, you were talking about being on a tour. When you go to a city or you experience a place, can you feel the energy that there was some thought or history or layers there? Is that something you can feel and, and kind of perceive as you go through? Yeah. I mean, it took me a while to be sort of like, you know, trained to think of the world that way and experience it that way. Because it is pretty easy just to kind of like go through your life and not notice these things, especially in your own neighborhood. But when you go to some place, I think people feel this when they're a tourist in other cities. They feel the connection to the place and, and how odd it is. And they love those little oddities. And that's one of the things that makes tourism so much fun. Now, when I go to a city, I particularly like the the little things, you know, um, those are the the little details of a city that, you know, kind of make it interesting that maybe people don't actually notice when they're there. Like I grew up and spent a lot of time living in Memphis, Tennessee, but I've been away for a long time. And when I went back, you know, in the past, I don't know, five years or something, I asked uh, some people, I was like, you know, it's a downtown and midtown, all the roads are brown mm. because they're kind of made with uh, some of the Mississippi mud, I think, and the aggregate. And uh, they said to me, the roads are brown? You know, like, <laughs> like they don't they don't even notice. That's what ends up happening. You have fresh eyes when you show up at a place. Do you ever feel like that longing for that connection of home? I mean, I know that Detroit and the Detroit area has a huge community of expats for a variety of reasons. Yet so many of our listeners and people who just talk about Detroit, they continually have this affinity for it and their nostalgic memories and things like that. Do you feel that kind of pull and how do you feel that kind of pull can influence a place? Well, I used to have just 
such disdain for that type of pull to tell you the mm. truth like, like i had i was sort of an anti-nostalgia person you know always like new things and forge new things and think new thoughts and you know progress and all that sort of stuff i was really into it but as i got older <laughs> i go back to places in my youth a lot of it in the in the south where my family is from and i do feel those things i think there's a way that they hit different parts of your emotions and and, and that's one of the key parts of the show and the book it's, it's like the built world it, it may feel cold in a product but it really is a reflection of who we are as humans and that stuff is infused in all this like hard surface it, like really does affect us and i i do think that there's a way that nostalgia for times past can be really pernicious in today's society but i do think that there's something to be gained from being in a place and holding on to it and coming back to it that gives you some perspective on the world as, as long as that doesn't impede actual progress in, in other ways. It's so easy for a place to ossify or get into the idea that it should never change. I remember it being this way and now that it's changed, it's somehow bad. Yeah, that's a, a real issue. And, and the thing is, is that even that thing, like we tend to enter into the world, we're, we're kind of narcissistic, solipsistic people. And it's, it's just sort of like the nature of who we are. We enter into the world and the, the city that we arrived in, you know, either by birth or, you know, by, you know, immigrating to a place is what we think of as the city. And it's important to note, and, and what the book really does show you, and the, and the show does this, is we meditate on this all the time, is that there were tons of decisions to get us to where we are now. And there was always, like always, some kind of choice that was made, you know, in a series of choices. And there's a bunch of like ad hoc solutions that froze in place that were never ideal. And there's some top down design and there's some bottom up interventions and all that big mix is a city. And it was never one thing at any point. It was always a mess of things and it was always changing. And so it's important to know that when you're thinking about how to change and adapt a city to what you need today and how to serve more people and how to be more equitable and, you know, how to handle a pandemic, you know, like all sorts of things. Like a city is an extremely mutable object and it's just good to keep that in mind, you know, like through the long runs of history and, and for our future. Well, I think that's a crucial point because although Detroit has been a city that its population decline has been documented for a long time, right? Like, like the whole yeah. world knows it, right? But yeah, yeah. there's so much spirit and energy here and there are things happening. But when you get into the online conversation or you get into people talking about the city one way or another, a lot of folks, they tend to go to the silver bullet solution. And I feel like having traveled a bit too, that a lot of cities will look at this and go, well, we build this stadium or we do this neighborhood or we do this mm -hmm. other thing. And one of the things I appreciate kind of going through the book is just the reminder of the collection of so many parts that it is and that that kind of talk is almost oversimplistic. And I mean, maybe just to me and feel free to correct me, but I feel like that kind of talk seems to be, although it's great for clicks and headlines and Twitter, mm -hmm. it's misguided. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> I'm in total agreement with you. <laughs> like, um, there rarely is a solution that fits across all kinds of cities and there's never one. And a lot of the ones that people think of as even solutions like stadium. I don't know if a stadium has ever helped a city. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like, <laughs> I mean, so I think that there's all kinds of things. And, and one of the things that's important to keep on top of is like, even from block to block, like this is one of the reasons why the last chapter in the book is about urbanism. And it really is about this conversation between the people who use the city and the city makers, essentially. And the important thing to making a city work is to listen to its constituency and like, how do they use the city? How do they need it? And, and how do they adapt it to make it make sense and how to be flexible in those ways? And then how to steal the best ideas and then make them policy um, is a huge part of what makes cities successful. And, you know, one of the things that happens, and I think Detroit went through this, you know, a a period of flailing, you know, like trying to figure out like, what does this mean for us? You know? And so there's like big ideas and big solutions and, and also maybe small experimentation and that gives some a fertile ground to try new things and see what works. And that is hopeful. But one of the reasons why 99% Invisible is basically a stealth history show rather than, you know, really <laughs> like a design, like of the future show is, you know, I think that the interesting part is the decision and then the effect and how it affected humans. And I never like to pick the winners when it comes to the proposals right now of what's going to make 
you know, Detroit work, for example, you know what I mean? Like, I don't like to say like, you know, like this disruptive solution or this silver bullet solution. I'm always skeptical of those things. And I really need like a good decade before I can process, you know, like how well <laughs> things work. It's very much because cities are this complex organism and it really does like what works well for one person really is not good for another person. And a city is by definition, a collection of people. <laughs> so it is always hard but that it's worth the struggle to figure it out. But it's never going to be one thing, and it's never going to be one thing across a whole city. That's for sure. You know, you're talking about stealing ideas from other cities. That's something that I see a lot of covering this city, and I feel like it is mm. common in other places as well. But I think the thing that a lot of developers and people who think about spaces sometimes forget is it needs to be, I think, steal and adapt. Mm -hmm. Because so often sure. it's like, oh, I saw this thing in Europe. I'm going to build it here. Well, Okay, but also, how can we make it Detroity? And the things that are going to succeed are going to be the things that make mm -hmm. us uniquely Detroity. I mean, I feel like that's one of the standout things is that, and, and this happens in urban areas around the country, I think. It's like, well, if we just do more of these kinds of homes, well, if you want to be a suburb, then be a suburb. But a suburb is not a city. And like, it's that idea of individual place and maybe places. Like their identity really matters to draw people, keep people and engage people. Absolutely. It really has to be centered in a place and with the people who are going to use it. That's just like so fundamental that it's like it's 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 so weird that we have to state it. <laughs> almost, you know? But I do think there's a good lessons to be made in, in, in doing some stealing and doing some adapting and, and experimenting and and realizing that the city changes and there's going to be mistakes and there's going to be money spent that people wish wasn't spent. You know, there's all kinds of things, but you know, not, none of this stuff is easy. Living together is hard. Cities have their certainly complex issues, but they're also extremely resilient. Like every time there's some kind of big disaster or there's like a hollowing out of a population of a city, there's all these notions and, and think pieces on like, well, is New Orleans not going to survive Katrina or is Detroit not going to survive? New York is apparently dead now. Exactly. I was just on a radio show and they were talking about how New York is dead and stuff. But cities are so resilient. Like, I think that the thought about, if you th I mean, like, it was really a notion of like, do we ever rebuild those parts of New Orleans in 2005? And I think that thought like lasted maybe uh, 10 minutes or something. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> like, it's not, you know, cities are important. Our homes are important and um, people fight for them. And so, you know, they're extremely resilient. And I, I kind of think that they're always going to make, I mean, they'll change in different ways. And, you know, maybe a city won't be as big as it, it once was. And it, I'm always fascinated by when we're in our present moment, we think about, you know, the inevitability of something like New York. But, you know, like, you know, 70 years ago, Detroit was just as likely to be the biggest city in North America in a lot of ways, you know, and you never know how these things are going to go. And it's going to keep on changing. And who knows now that if we have really decentralized working cultures, where people are going to be, it's going to keep changing. But I still think that even if people can spread out across the entire United States, we're still going to gather together into cities because there's just something about the friction of bumping up against the people and being able to get that really good food from Vietnam or you know, something yeah. you know, that just keeps us together, you know, and wanting to mix. Yeah. I mean, I'm in a Detroit neighborhood and I love the connections that are made between all of the people here. And like, it's a place where you could visibly see, you know, we've been going through this pandemic. We got hit really hard early on. Yeah. Nowadays, it's nowadays, if you don't wear your mask around people, they'll like yell at you across the porch. <laughs> right. Like, cause here in Detroit, Good. we got hit. And so people take it seriously. For sure. Yeah. And in my neighborhood, one of the beauties of a city that I think is under told is a few doors down, uh, a woman was in the hospital for 30 days for coronavirus, mm -hmm. 30 days. Oh my God. And the word came with a few days that she was going to make it out. And this is a woman who always keeps her house mm -hmm. completely impeccable on the outside. Yeah. And the neighborhood just rallied. There wasn't even a question. There wasn't a <laughs> Facebook group. It was just like a text chat and like a little bit. And all of a sudden, everybody was out there raking leaves, straightening up the porch, doing touch-ups. It's that community, and it's part of why I love living in a city. And when I've been spending time in, in other places that don't have that community, I almost feel lonely, yeah. I think. And that's part of why I love cities. Yeah. 
I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, I'm much more introverted. Like I kind of know my cross the street neighbor. I have a hard time with, you know, getting to know everybody, but I still love it. You know, like I still kind of need it and I need the noise and I need, um, I basically just kind of need like to be able to go and do a thing, <laughs> <laughs> but there's parts of rural living that I totally love too. And, but that stuff will change over time. You know, it's the city doesn't even suit a single person the same way over time, mm. but that's a brilliant thing to have in your neighborhood where everyone recognizes what this woman needs and what would make her happy. And that's, that's a glorious thing that we all take care of those things together. So uh, a couple final questions. The first one is I asked some listeners if I could talk to Roman Mars, what would you want to talk to him about? (laughs) And uh, because I have a group of truly like nerdy people, (laughs) the question was, how do you feel about transit, mass transit? And how do you feel about cars in general? Because there's always been this tension that the Motor City is this place that put the world on wheels. But but it also through its freeways and development decisions the car also hollowed out yeah. the city and was big in its demise. I live right next to, and I know this is an extraneous detail, but I live right next to a road that is a surface street that is four lanes. And it's four lanes because it used to be the way that all the cars went downtown for work. Mm-hmm. And now it's still four lanes, but there's maybe one car every five minutes. Wow. And that's because of the freeways, right? right and right. it's th- this infrastructure that's left over from this time. A lot of it was emptied out by the thing that gave wealth mm-hmm. to the area. It's an irony, yeah. if you will. I mean, I feel mixed about cars. I do have a car. I live in like an area that's pretty reliant on cars, like Berkeley and Oakland. They've got uh, some decent mass transit, but it's not as pervasive as it should be or is in places like New York, for example. And so I think that cities, especially out in the West, were probably designed too much around the car. And you need a multimodal form of like a movement to make a city really healthy in my opinion and i think we kind of overdid it with cars in terms of cities but there's but cars are super uh, useful and great and they serve a different purpose and and i have no like huge objection <laughs> to the existence of cars <laughs> it would be great if cities were built around dense centers where public transit would work well and then cars would work in the in the you know outer portions and uh, that makes a lot of sense to me that a city would always be a mix of those things and then bikes and and then even scooters and i'm a huge walker i i love to walk i'll I'll walk a lot further than most people will to do things (laughs) and i also like that to be a you know like a priority you know like as, as a walker you know cars are often an issue but uh, so are bikes. You know? like, <laughs> like, like I'm almost killed. It seems like by a bicycle, like 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 once a week. So I think that's important to have a good mix to make a healthy city. And the one thing that I don't like about cars in particular is they take up so much space for their utility, and then empty parking spaces and all that. They just like sit there open and that could be used for other things. That that's the real part about cars is like there's space and then their carbon footprint. And if there was a way to reduce that where there was less free parking and or parking that was actually like um, priced appropriately for an economy and then there were no emissions in a car, you know, the, the mode of transit itself, we could work with that as long as we worked with everything else too. Makes sense. You know, there are a few vignettes that involve Michigan and Detroit in the book <laughs> of many. One I wanted to pick out specifically, and it, it's a story that's a fan favorite and Listeners to this show, I mean, even just a few days ago, I did an episode on the origins of some of the streets, some of our main streets that mm-hmm. are like large connectors. They actually have roots as, as trails and and all the other things. What drew you to that story? Not necessarily breaking down all the individual right, bits, right, because right. I know a lot of listeners may already know it, but like what for you not being from here and being interested in spaces drew you to that vignette and that story? Well, you know, Detroit in particular has all these different like roads that have these historic moments when they were placed, you know, sort of like the you know city founding and stuff like related to appealing to a, a grid structure, which fits uh, cars in particular. And what I love about it is the vision of a city as this kind of palimpsest, this, this like piece of paper we write over and over and over again. 
And that's the thing that we're reading when we read the city of today. And it wasn't, you know, written all at once and it wasn't perfect. And, you know, sometimes parts of it were erased and written over, but some of it, parts of it weren't erased very well and then written over. (laughs) And I think that just makes a city like rich and fascinating when you can look at it in an instant and like a, in a momentary view and still see the long, rich history to why it is the way it is today. And sometimes it's like, oh, it's such a mess, you know, like, like it's hard to navigate and one on top of another clearly doesn't work. But to me, that type of stuff is fun if you can get over the frustration of it, you know, as a person you know, having to navigate it. And that's the kind of way I look at it. Like when I'm in downtown and I see all of those wedgy streets, <laughs> I think about the world with, you know, I know where some of the old streetcars yeah. had their drop off points and I can see one that I know specifically that's like Gratiot near Randolph. I know this doesn't mean anything to you, but I'm just sharing the story. I've seen pictures of this giant platform that used to be there where the streetcar would come in and drop off hundreds of people at a time and then go right back out again to hit it. And I sit there and I go, I can remember all of these these scenes if I've seen the pictures. Or for me as a kid, you know, my dad painted buildings. And so he would drop me off with the arcade owner in one of our historic neighborhoods, Greektown. There was a arcade and he dropped the, me off with a bag of quarters with this guy who chomped a lot of cigars. Mm-hmm. Right. And like I would hear all of these stories because I was in this magical spot of not completely all the way down, but not turning around yet. So kind of seeing some of the remnants of what was and then to what is today. And Like, I try to find some joy in it and in the little bit of frustration. If you look at things, and I'm a walker too, and going through and saying, oh, what is that building? Or what is that metal piece on the building? And you'll learn in the field guide that that helps hold the building Mm -hmm. together, but it's also like a little piece of art and it says something. Right. Yeah. I love that stuff. I love adaptive reuse in, in, in a lot of ways and preservation and, you know, the, the layout and the remnants and the ghosts of what once was in a city really do make it delightful you know like i love a good grid you know i love a good like well laid out city that's you know like kind of designed from the ground up to be kind of perfect and squared off but like there's real joy in finding those little leftover triangles (laughs) that are (laughs) unaccounted for and how people use those spaces and how some of them are left behind and they're kind of fallow and they're forgotten and uh, there's a way to you know present them and find real pleasure in them and then sometimes people find them and turn them into something like grand you know like there's a a story here in Oakland where this leftover triangle of land that was uncared for and people just dumped stuff on it a man put a little buddha statue out there just to sort of like claim it as a place and the podcast criminal did a story about that that we ran on the show and, and we put that story in the book And it really transformed that part of the neighborhood because people began to come to the Buddha and then build little houses around the Buddha. (laughs) And you can turn any place into something special as long as people all kind of get together and and claim it and and take a little bit of responsibility and then take a whole lot of joy from the little leftover portions of our cities. And, you know, it's kind of nice to find places that are unclaimed or left over because you can really do something cool with them and since they're usually uh, kind of valueless to a lot of people you're allowed a lot of freedom to kind of just go for it that is part of the tension here in detroit as different neighborhoods you know start to see more investment i don't really like the term come back and i really hate the term clean slate that people yeah. use like some people say that a cafe recently that that closed or a restaurant that closed and people were, were sad about it and like oh what's going to happen And I think to myself, when I was a kid, it was another cafe that me and my grandmother used to go to. And like that space, although it it stinks that that place closed, it's going to find another life. And like, it's not necessarily bad that a chapter closes. Sometimes they need to close. Sometimes that's the the end of that particular story. And it's time for a new one. Yeah. It's always hard when it happens when you're like the individual involved in it, for sure. But it's a huge part of the way cities are. And it's a huge part of markets. It's a huge part of like how, you know, just even the ecology of, of a field or a forest works, you know, like there has to be things that die and move along for things to grow up and evolve. And that's the way cities are. They're ecosystems like everything else. And so it's important to sort of recognize that and keep a good long view so that you can sort of recognize the opportunities when they present themselves to be sure. Yeah. 
Well, you know something that has a lot of chapters and that people will keep coming back to over and over again? <laughs> <laughs> it would be The 99% Invisible City, a field guide to the hidden world of everyday design. I would say that it's also not just a field guide, but I mean, I've never seen such a compendium of love letters to the everyday world. And I really appreciate that passion, Roman. Oh, thank you so much, Jared. I really appreciate you uh, saying nice things about the book and for talking to me and having me on. That's uh, been so great. I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did. In coming attractions, we're working on the story of how an elevator from the old Hudson's flagship department store in downtown Detroit, yeah, the one demolished back in uh, the late 90s. Well, it was saved and brought back to life, fully functional. Plus, Dr. Paul Thomas and technologist Tom Lawrence will join me to talk about contact tracing, COVID-19, and what we need to know this week around the pandemic. There are some things you can do to help. And well, you know, this place, it's full of stories. There's always something to tell you about. So be sure to listen on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you download your favorite podcasts. If you got feedback for the show, email me at jer at dailydetroit.com or call us at 313-789-3211. If you want to support what we're doing, membership is crucial. Ads just don't pay the bills anymore for thoughtful media. And if you find value in what we're doing, become a member. You can do that at patreon.com slash daily Detroit. With that, I'm Jer Stays. Thanks for listening. Take care of each other, and I'll see you around Detroit.